You came to this channel to talk about programmable logic controllers, didn't you? Like the ones in the trainers that are behind me. But your instructor decided to bring a vacuum tube instead. Let me explain why. This vacuum tube was my introduction to control electronics. The transmitter was built in the 1960s and it shared a lot of the features that the programmable logic controllers had. Understand that the vacuum tube is a very delicate device. There are certain conditions that must be true in order for it to remain operational. It starts with these holes in the bottom that allow air to come into the device, cool the pins, and then flow in a chimney around the top of the tube. Next, the filaments were turned on. The filaments are inside this anode structure, the black structure, and they glow like a light bulb. You had to wait about 30 seconds from when the filaments were on until you could do the next step. Next, you turned on bias. You had to make sure the bias voltages were all correct, and then you could turn on the high voltage. You could apply the 11,000 volts to the top of this tube, and then everything would work normally, you hope. That transmitter was a monster to work on, let me tell you. I remember it had small relays like this. It must have had about a hundred of them. And I remember looking at the schematics for it, and it was arranged like rungs on a ladder. And there was over a hundred rungs for that particular piece of gear. But it turns out, again, all of the ideas from that transmitter are also applicable to the PLCs. We had the concept of permissives, protections, interlocks, timers, and counters. And all those ideas, all that vocabulary is still alive in these programmable logic controllers. My name is Aaron Dolan, and it is my pleasure to introduce this course. This is the star of the show. You are looking at a Micro 800 programmable logic controller. Specifically, you are looking at the Micro 830. This particular PLC has inputs and outputs. The inputs are on this terminal block up here. We'll talk about those in a moment. These are the outputs right here. We have power connections here. You can just make that out. There's 24 volts DC. We have a run program remote switch, a USB programming cable, and this is a communications port. And there's actually a device plugged into it right now. A PLC has things you can look at. That's the theme of the lecture today. Things you can look at. And what you can look at are the input status light emitting diodes, the LEDs. In this particular case, you can see that input 2, 3, and 13 are active. So if we go across, this is input 0, 1, 2, and 3, so those are the red wires, and then 13 is way over here. Now, how many inputs does this have? The answer is not 13. The answer is 14. You have to watch out for that. Check it out. So if we have input 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And if you said that the answer was 4, that is what's called an off by 1 error. So you have to guard against that. Um, it's a pretty common thing in computer programming. It even has a name, OB1. Anyway, inputs 2 and 3 and 13 are lit. The outputs, again, these were the output terminals here. In this case, output 3 is lit. How many outputs are there? The answer is not 9, the answer is 10. And just real quick, if you were to add up the number of inputs and the number of outputs, so that's 14 plus 10, you would get 24. And if you look way over here, this particular PLC is called a 24-point programmable logic controller. There's also some additional information down here. This particular one is a 24-volt DC power supply, and it's DC sourcing. When we get to hardware section, that'll mean some more to us. What else? Oh, uh, this PLC has plug-in modules. This is an example one here. The IF4 is an analog input. The OF2 is an analog output. And then this is an isolated serial interface that we might use in the next class. Here are status LEDs. Power and run should be activated if everything's going well. Uh, fault should not be activated. If it is, something's gone wrong with the PLC, or more likely, 
the program has done something wrong. For example, a division by zero is really bad. It'll put that into a fault. Also, if you're dealing with memory arrays, you have to be careful. Remember that OB1 thing I told you about? So if you had a memory array, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and you tried to activate the fifth thing in that array, that would be a fault for accessing something outside of an array. That fault would turn red, and you'd be done. The PLC would shut down. We'll talk about what it means to force a PLC a little bit later. Um, we kind of did it with the relay when we pushed it like so. That's called forcing a relay. The last LED is the communications LED, and that will flash when traffic is going over this port or over this isolated serial port. Again, the theme of today is things that you can see on a PLC. You can see the status lights, at least for, thing, at least for things that are steady. It doesn't help if you have a momentary, like a glitch, you wouldn't be able to see that necessarily, or a pulse. But if you have something like a switch that's on for a period of time, you'll easily be able to see that. Likewise, the outputs, if they're on for any reasonable amount of time, your eyeballs can detect that. This diagram shows the PLC at the 10,000 foot level. We have the programmable logic controller, and that is sandwiched between field devices which are the sensors and switches, and the field devices over here, which are the actuators and controllers. We say field device because it's the stuff out in the field. It's the stuff that's bolted onto the machinery to either sense what's going on, uh, detect that you've pushed a button, or to activate some aspect of the machinery. For example, a solenoid. Interposing relays. Interpose means to put yourself in between. We'll talk about this in a moment because a relay is something that you can physically observe. And while we're here, we also have AC power and we have DC power. And I, I suppose you could argue that you can see that as well, because if you don't have the DC power or AC power, depending on which PLC you have, if you don't have that going to the PLC, the power light will not be on. To get us started, I put together this little circuit so we can explore how the PLC operates. Now, we have the PLC in the middle. Again, this is the Micro 830. We have our power supply connections here, with blue being 24 volts, and the white with the blue stripe being the 24 volt return, or ground if you prefer. We have wire ducts to keep the wires so they're not quite so ugly. They're a lot like vests. You know, they hide all kinds of sins. We've got wires that are too long and wires that aren't terminated correctly. I'll just tuck it in there. It's all good. We have this relay, which is an interposing relay. And then we have this relay, which is a motor starter. Kind of hidden off screen, we have an indicator lamp. And then we have a switch and a push button. And the way it works is if the switch is on, we'll see the light comes on. If my camera had better resolution, you'd be able to see that when the switch is turned on, one of these LEDs come on. And maybe you can make that out. Maybe you can't. Okay. Now, we also have a push button. So when the switch is turned on and the push button is activated, then the relays activate. No switch, no relay. So again, switch on, and then we activate this. And here, you can see that the LED for the relay is on. I think you can just make out that this changes here. There's an orange shutter that appears in that window. And you can see the plunger of the motor starter as it's pulled in. What I'd like to do next is explore the components of a control relay. This here, this large black cylinder, is the electromagnet. Coils of wire are wound around a central core. You can see the core right here. The magnetic field is concentrated on that core, which will pull against the metal in the armature. So here is the armature moving. So if the coil was activated, it would be pulled like so. Can you see the pivot point back there? And there's also a spring that pulls against the armature and keeps it in place. So again, coil, armature, 
the pivot point, and the spring. We have a set of contacts here. First, we have the movable contact, and you can see that that contact, again right there, moves with the armature. We have two stationary contacts, and we would call this upper contact the normally closed contact. And it's normally closed because when the relay is sitting there, deactivated, it is closed. There's an electrical contact between the movable contact and the stationary contact. When the armature is activated, you can see we move to this contact, and that is the normally open contact. Again, as the relay is sitting there with no power attached to it, this contact is open. This relay actually has two pairs of contacts. We would call these poles. So here's the A pole, and here's the B pole. You can see that they are mechanically coupled together on the armature. The A pole has a movable contact, a normally closed, normally open, and the B has independent contacts as well. Here's the movable, here's the normally closed, and there's the normally open contact. To better understand how those switches are connected up to the PLC and understand how the relays are configured, let's take a very quick look at the input block and output block for a PLC. You'll notice that we have 24 volts here, and you'll notice the 24 volts here. You can think of that as the positive of the power supply and this as the ground. We need to connect our 24 volts to the proper places, and we need to connect our ground to the proper places to make the PLC operate. Now you notice we're operating on the input section here. So what we're going to do is we're going to connect up the ground to these points that are labeled as common. And then, oh, let's put a little dot there, and then we're going to add our switches as necessary. For example, we could put a, an actual switch here. Right, so there would be an example of a switch. We could put a push button here if we like. You could think of this when you, when you push that button, those contacts will close. We could also put in a normally closed push button if we chose. You'll notice that the bar is on the other side. So as you push, as you push this one, the contacts open, and as you push here, the contacts close. So we would call this a normally open contact. We would call this a normally closed contact. And then we would just add other devices as necessary. Again, as long as we connect this 24 volts somehow down to one of these, right, as long as we provide continuity there, we will have an input in that corresponding LED will light up. How many inputs are there? Again, there's 14. So we go from input 0 to input 13. Looking at the output block, like before, we're going to strike a line here. All right, so there's one there and one there. And now we need to connect to every place where it says 24 volts. So there's 124. That's the actual power supply to the unit. Here, we need to connect that terminal up. It's a plus common. And there's another one right here. So we would connect that terminal up. Then we would need to connect this to the ground. We would do the same here. And I think we have one more right there. Okay, so those are all the things that we would need to connect up for this particular type of PLC. We'll talk about that another day, but this guy right there, that right there determines that letter, the B there determines what kind of output stage this PLC has. Anyway, if you want to connect a device, say you wanted to connect a indicator lamp, so we'll make it a green indicator lamp, you would connect it up between. So what would happen is 24 volts would come in on this terminal here, right? 24 volts would come in here, and you could think of it internally 
as having a switch right here, right? You could think internally that's what's going on, is when you command the PLC to do something, this switch closes. Again, you can connect up anything else you want. For example, maybe you wanted to connect up a control relay. So CR1. All right, so that takes care of the input blocks and the output blocks. Again, the top of the PLC is the input block and the bottom is the output block. On our mock-up, you recall we had the PLC, we had a relay in the middle, and then we had a motor starter. So what I'm going to do now is take a quick look at the relay and its components. When we schematically describe a relay, it looks something like this. We have a coil, a dashed line. That dashed line leads to contacts. So this here would be the movable contact right here, and then this would be the normally closed contact, and this would be the normally open contact. If we stopped here, we would call this a single pole double throw relay. If we added another set of contacts, for example something like this, now we have a double pole double throw relay, which is what I showed you earlier. Again, with this being the normally closed contact and this being the normally open contact. Now that's one way of showing your relays. Another way, which is fairly common, is you'll show the relay as a circle. You notice that's what I did up here. I showed the relay, control relay one, as a circle. And then you'll show the contacts like so, where this is the normally open contact and this is the normally closed contact. And that particular relay had two of them, so we'll put them both in there. Okay, so normally closed and normally open. Again, um, remember this dashed line showed that there was a mechanical connection between the coil and the relay contacts. When we went to this nomenclature, we disconnected that. We got rid of the line. But you have to remember that anytime you see a coil, those contacts are still mechanically attached. So it gets really interesting now when we start describing our PLC with our input block and our output block, and on that output block we find a CR1, right? And we know that when the PLC commands it, this is the coil of a relay that will activate. And then we go to a completely different schematic, and we suddenly find that same designation next to a set of contacts. And you have to remember that there's, there's a dashed line between these two. Again, it's not shown, but you have to remember that it's there. Okay, so magic contacts appear out of nowhere. Well, not really, but just remember they're connected. Remember we had the PLC, that relay in the middle, and then we had the motor starter. So the relay in the middle was our CR1. Now we're going to show the motor starter relay. So this is the overload coils on that. We'll talk about those in a moment. And then you have the coil of the motor starter. And let's go back and take a look at this physically. One of the outputs of the PLC is used to activate this relay. This relay then activates the motor starter. In fact, let's see if we can put those side by side. Make this a little bit bigger. 
so not quite so hard to see. There, not too bad. So we talked about the input block, which is up on the top. We talked about output block, which is here. On that output block, we have this CR1. That is this relay right here. And when we push the push button, we see that relay activates. So there's that green LED that we mentioned. The contacts, one of the contacts, which is this blue wire right down here, and this blue wire that's flying in the air. Okay, so what we're talking about is this point right here is that blue wire tucked away down there. The contact goes through the relay. It comes out here, so now we're here. Now we go to this thing called overload, which we haven't talked about yet, but we'll get there. So overload, and for overload, we go back to the motor starter um, coil, and then we go back to ground through there. I did mention something about forcing a relay. Let's do that and see what it looks like. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over here to this interposing relay, and we're going to push this button. Do you see what happened? When I push the button here, this relay activates. Or another way of saying that is when I activate this, not electrically now, mind you, but by forcing the relay, we establish an electrical contact here, and this line evaluates as true. So we push it, and you'll notice, uh, whoops, you can maybe see the orange there, but there's no green light. Okay, So that's forcing a relay. This particular relay actually has a feature that allows you to do that permanently. So you can push this tab open, and it'll hold the relay mechanically activated. All right, so far so good. Let's go back and talk about this motor starter. Here's some pictures of that motor starter. You'll notice that I've taken it apart here. We have a contactor, which is essentially a heavy duty relay. Typically these things have three phases. This here was made for a, a large three phase motor. You see the three phases there. That's the input and this is the output here. Normally this device here, which is called the overload block is bolted in. You can see the three input connectors there. And then the motor is connected here. You can see that fully assembled here, where you have the three input lines, the output of the contactor, and then down here the output of the overload block. Inside the overload block, you see this assembly. Now what we have is the power comes in, and it goes through this, this heater, this heater. And that heater is wound around a bimetallic strip. What will happen is it will push in this direction. And when it pushes in that direction, it trips the overload portion of this block. In fact, you see this little tab right here? I'm going to go back and show you that on the actual device. You can just make out that part right there. So say we have our devices running, and for some reason we have a fault with the motor, it will trip, whoops, oh. there we go, notice the tab is missing. Uh, this is tripped, see the intermediate, or the interposing relay is activated, but this one now is dead, it won't activate. Because what's happened is the overload, this normally closed contact, has been opened. And as soon as that happens, you're no longer able to activate the coil in the motor starter. There's a reset button right here. Notice the tab comes out again, and now it should operate normally. There's any number of conditions that could cause this thermal overload to activate. The motor could be defective, obviously. You could have a phase imbalance. Maybe one of your three phases doesn't have the right voltage or current on it, which would cause the other two to overheat. You could have a brownout condition, in which case the motor will pull more current. Uh, let's see, what else? If you start and stop the motor too many times in a row, it tends to heat up. So you've got to watch out for all those types of things.
Or the motor could also be mechanically overloaded as well, which would cause it to overheat. Well, we covered a lot of things. So I think what we should do now is do a quick recap, and then we'll call it a day. So the theme of the lecture was things you can see. And we said that you can see the LEDs on the PLC. You could see the input LEDs. You could see the output LEDs. You could see the status. And you could also see LEDs on some, but not all, plugins. We talked about the PLC being sandwiched between field devices on the input and the output, which is on the lower part of the PLC, also goes to field devices. Again, field devices is just a generic name for the various sensors, switches, on the input and actuators and drives on the output. Things you can see. You can see interposing relays. Sometimes you can observe the contacts. Some of them have LEDs. The one we had in the lab, you could see it had a green LED on it. There was an indicator window. And that's orange for that particular one. And there's also ways to force a relay. We mentioned the motor starters. We could see the plunger of the motor starter. It was rather large. Also on the overload block, you could sometimes see if it had been tripped. We should mention safety. Now, <laughs> look. The fact is, you've got to be really careful if you're going to go force a relay. You need to know exactly what's going to happen before you do this. For instance, let's say we had a pump, and that pump was operating against a valve. And just to make the situation worse, let's assume this is a positive displacement pump, and this valve is closed. Positive displacement, okay? Now, if you were to go to that motor starter and force it by pushing the plunger in, you're in trouble. Something is going to break in this situation. A positive displacement pump will have a tremendous pressure and you'll rupture the pump, you'll rupture the valve, or you could actually hurt somebody in the process. I think we talked about types of relays. So a very simple relay would look like this. And we would call this a single pole, single throw. A slightly more complicated relay might be this one. Again, the dashed line indicates a mechanical connection between the contacts. This relay would be a double pole, single throw. And we'll do one more. And we're going to call this one 
a single pull, double throw. Okay. So if you look at this, we would say this is a pull, this is a pull, which makes this a double pull, single throw relay. This is a single pull, but there are two different places the contacts could be in, so it's a double throw. Until next time, be safe.